Well, a very good evening to you again. What a wonderful day in Bucky. We've been told that we needed to bring our jumpers and make sure that by this time in the week we were ready to sort of batten down the hatches for winter. But um, it's been a wonderful day, hasn't it? And uh, the coast here is so glorious. I was reading my Bible this morning, uh, looking out over the golf course to the sea and the mountains beyond and worshipping God as creator and thought what a wonderful setting in which to do that as the, the majesty of what God has done in creation is, is just spread out before us like that. I hope those of you who live here know just what a wonderful place it is and uh, we're very grateful for the way that you've welcomed us here. We've got quite um, a long reading tonight. Um, I'm going to try and cap uh, cover from chapter 2 verse 11 to chapter 4 verse 16. I was saying this to Abby just over tea, who then reminded me that he's doing all of Job 4 to 32 tomorrow, so there was no sympathy there. <laughs> but um, it is quite a long reading, and so what I thought I'd do is read uh, from chapter 2 first and then come back to a second part of the reading uh, partway through the talk. So please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 2, and we'll read from verses 11 to 22, and then pause there. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law, with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for your word written. Thank you that we can hold it in our hands and receive it into our hearts. Please grant that by your spirit you may teach that word to us this evening. Please Grant me the strength and insight from the Spirit to present your truth with clarity and gentleness. And please grant to each of us the humility of heart to hear what you, the Lord, would say. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I hope you've been enjoying getting into Ephesians as much as I have over these last uh, few evenings. We take a little bit of a turn in our journey through Ephesians uh, as we uh, get to this section. It is in many ways the middle section and the heart of the book. This really is the burden of Ephesians, the key thing, I think, which the Apostle Paul was wanting to say. So we've moved from seeing the great blessings that we have in Christ 
and then the riches of his glorious grace that we were exploring yesterday. And now we're homing in on our title for the series about our place in God's plan, looking at the extraordinary way that God has woven the church of Jesus with all its faults and failings into his great plan for creation. So that's where we're going to explore this evening, a united church, a united church. But let me begin with something a little bit light-hearted and tongue-in-cheek. You may have heard it before, but it's only semi-tongue-in-cheek, I guess. Here it is, a little poem. Like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've always trod. We are much divided, many bodies we, strong in favoured doctrines, weak in charity. Sit here then, ye people, join our useless throng, blend with ours your voices in a feeble song. Blessings, ease and comfort, ask from Christ the King, with our lofty thinking, doing not a thing. Backward, Christian soldiers, fleeing from the fight, with the cross of Jesus nearly out of sight. It's one of those things that you don't know whether to laugh or to cry, isn't it, when it's read. It's kind of funny, but it feels a bit too near the mark sometimes, doesn't it? Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not here to criticize the church, and I'm not here to criticize your church. I don't know your church, so how can I? I love the church of Jesus Christ, and I know many fine churches where wonderful things are happening in our time. We don't want to get down on the church. Nonetheless, if we're honest, we do all know, I think, that in the churches, we do have a tendency to get stuck in the past, to be painfully slow to change, to get divided over things that needn't divide us, distracted by things that are not really that important, defensive as if everything is the last hill to stand on, fleeing from the real fight because we're preoccupied with too many small fights. Somebody once said to me, John, you can be so determined to be right on everything that you end up wrong on some very big things. And we have that tendency, I think, within the church. And for a moment, I want us just to feel what a disaster it is when that happens. And what a slur on Christ, whose name the Christian church bears. We're not just here to be a nice little cosy club of people who get things just the way we like them. We're here to represent Christ in his creation. What a tragedy when the church, the Christian church, fails to do that. And what an aching chasm away from the vision for the church that burns in the heart of the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter to, well, the Ephesians and perhaps some of the other churches in that region of Turkey. He's got this astonishing vision of the church, a church established at the cross, indwelt by the living presence of God, by the Spirit, united across social and ethnic boundaries, built up in love, and built into the heart of God's purposes for the future of the world. An astonishing, lofty, inspirational vision for the church of Jesus. That's what Ephesians is all about. So as we reach the heart of this letter this evening, let me give you a warning. It's rather high-octane stuff. It's there very much to inspire us and to encourage us, but also in equal measure to challenge us. Because Jesus hasn't given up on his church. He doesn't have a plan B. His purpose is to use his church for the purposes of his kingdom. And he's wanting us on board in what he wants to do. Now, we've got a lot to cover in this section, so we won't be able to delve into every detail. But we'll start with the passage we've just read, which explores for us the creation of a united church. The creation of a united church. And in short, it is created through the cross. Chapter 2, verse 
15 in the middle, God's purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The ancient Near Eastern world, of course, was sharply divided between Jew and Gentile. But the Apostle Paul, who was himself a Jew, had come to see that this great division had been overcome by the gospel message. So that the ancient promise to Abraham that all the nations would be blessed through Abraham's offspring was to be fulfilled in Christ, the true Israelite, the ultimate Israelite, who embodied in himself all that Israel was called to be. And that's why he now finds himself writing to a group of churches which, like most of our churches, were predominantly Gentile. That means non-Jewish. So how can it be that we who, as Gentiles, were once excluded, have now been embraced by the grace of God? That's what Paul is answering here. Verses 11 to 13, our story, our story. How has this come about? Verse 11, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the bo- that which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. What, what a grim list for Gentile people. Excluded from hope, excluded from community, excluded from blessing, excluded even from God himself. This is not a feel-good passage, is it, for a nice Tuesday evening. But, verse 13, now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In the first century world, Gentiles who became Jews were said to have been brought near. Paul is using that language here, but he isn't talking about people becoming Jews. He's talking about people becoming Christians and assuring them that in Christ, they have moved from exclusion to embrace. How come? Well, because of our Savior, verses 14 to 18. Our story, verses 11 to 13. Our Savior, verses 14 to 18. Because Jesus the Christ is the great peacemaker in whom the Jewish and Gentile people are united and reconciled. Verse 14. He, Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups, Jew and Gentile, one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. How has he done that? Verse 15, he's done it by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now, it's a little bit technical here, but let me try and explain. The law of Moses that we have in the Old Testament reinforced and in some ways made visible the division between Jewish people and Gentile people. Both because The Jewish people had the law while the Gentiles didn't, but also because the law established certain practices which had the effect of separating Jewish people from those of other nations. Practices like circumcision and Sabbath keeping and food laws and the festivals which marked the Jewish people out among the nations. But Jesus, in the perfect obedience of his life, fulfills all the demands of the law and in his death he took the penalty for all our breaking of the law on the cross so now if we are in Christ the law is both fulfilled and its penalty satisfied whether we are Gentile believers or Jewish believers and therefore its demands are no longer the basis on which we relate to God. And therefore, the power, the authority of the law over us in that sense has been broken. 
And by bringing that power to an end, setting aside the law with its commandments and regulations, Jesus has taken down the barrier between the two groups, the Jewish people and the Gentile people. The result is the creation of a whole new humanity in which Jew and Gentile together are reconciled to God as one people in Christ. Middle of verse 15. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so Jewish people and Gentile people alike are invited to know God intimately through his son, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away, the Gentile people, and peace to those who were near, the Jewish people. For through him, through Christ, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit, our Saviour has reconciled both of us to God through the cross. And that changes everything. It gives us a new status. We've had our story, our saviour. Now verses 19 to 22, our status. Consequently, verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, the excluded people, but rather fellow citizens of God's people and also members of his household. In other words, Jewish and Gentile believers together are both privileged citizens in the kingdom. We are a people together and we are members together of a family. Both of these are images of the church, aren't they? A people and a household, a family, both images of the church. And that church is built on the truth of the gospel, the apostles and the prophets, verse 20, and a recognition of the supremacy of Christ. And then a third image of the church, a a people, a family, but also a temple, the place of God's presence, the meeting place between heaven and earth. Verse 21, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, that isn't saying that church buildings like this lovely building here are temples. They are not. They are buildings. But it is saying that the community of believers united in Christ across all the boundaries of ethnicity and society, that community is a dwelling place of God, a meeting place between earth and heaven. The place where God lives within his creation. What a privilege. Our story, we were excluded, but we brought home. Because of our saviour who broke the dividing wall of hostility through the cross to make us one. So that now we share a common status as citizens of a people, members of a family. uh, Stones built into the temple in which He lives. That's the creation of a united church. I want to bring out a couple of implications. I recognize that's fairly kind of dense kind of stuff we've gone through, but let's just stand back from it and pick up a couple of implications. The first is that diversity in the church is not an optional extra, but a sacred gift. For Paul, of course, as we've seen, the division was between the Jewish people and Gentile people. And let's say it's very important that Christians today should have no truck with anti-Semitism. We should love the Jewish people and help them find their true Messiah. But there are other divisions as well for us to overcome. Let me highlight three. There's the racial gap. There's the socioeconomic gap the wealth gap, and there's the generation gap as well. And the church needs to be a community where all three of these barriers, and indeed others, are intentionally and visibly crossed and overcome. 
Because diversity in the church is not an optional extra. It's a sacred, blood-bought gift for us to treasure. Now, this is not going to be at all easy for us. It's not easy for us, is it? And I think it's getting harder in a society that's shaped by culture wars, which encourage us to assert our right to have things just the way we like them and discourage us from trying to see the world from within anybody else's shoes. And those culture wars readily turn us into victims whenever we find that our preferences haven't prevailed and we don't get our way. Immediately, a million people on social media will tell you how dreadfully badly you've been treated and how awful the world is to you. Friends, we have to resist all of that. We have to resist it primarily because of the cross. The purpose of Jesus in going to the cross was not to save a whole world of people like John Risbridger, what a dreadful thought, but to save a people from every nation, tribe and tongue and every generation and every strata in society and to make them gloriously one in the church. That's what the cross achieves. And therefore, we have to resist the culture wars and the divisions for the sake of the cross. We have to resist it for the sake of Christ, who came, down, who came to tear down the walls of hostility, not to build them up higher than ever. We have to resist that pressure to divide, frankly, if the church is to be the church. We have to resist it for the sake of the poor, and the foreigner who are so readily excluded in our societies but must never be excluded in the church of Jesus. And we have to resist it for the new generations whom we as older generations, most of us, are responsible to reach and to flex towards and to welcome and to love and to nurture, and to mentor, and to encourage, and to draw into leadership, and release so that the future may be better than the past. That's our responsibility. So friends, let's be honest. If deep down I really want the church to be basically for people like me, frankly, I need to repent, because I'm out of step with the gospel, and out of step with the heartbeat of God. Unity in diversity in the church is not a nice-to-have extra for the theologically soft-headed. It is the sacred, blood-bought achievement of the cross, which is ours to treasure and to nurture and is not ours to negotiate away for the sake of our convenience and cultural identity. Diversity in the church is a sacred gift. But second, worship in the church is a holy privilege. Remember verses 17 and 18? He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. How can we just read those verses and, and just move on? I mean, they're glorious, aren't we? Aren't they? Through Christ... We both, Jew and Gentile, old and young, slave and, and free, rich and poor, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Wonderful, wonderful privilege. The church is not just a club. It's not just an organization. It's a supernatural community in which God lives by his spirit. And though we deserve to be pushed away because of our sin and rebellion, we are welcomed as citizens of that people, of members of that family, built into the holy dwelling place of God on earth. God is present everywhere. We know that. That's part of what it means for God to be God. Nonetheless, as we read through Scripture, it's clear that God also makes himself present in particular ways, in particular places, for particular purposes. And this active, intentional, holy presence of God is something very wonderful. 
So when Moses experiences his presence at the burning bush, he doesn't say, oh no, God can't be specially here because God's everywhere and therefore that's the end of the whole business of the presence of God. No, he says, I must take my sandals off my feet because this is holy ground. God is here. Oh, God was still everywhere, but he was revealing himself and coming near to Moses in the burning bush. When Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Habakkuk encounter God's presence in the rest of the Old Testament and indeed the Apostle John at the end of the Bible in Revelation, they fall to the ground in reverence and worship. Now in the Old Testament, God's presence was known primarily in the temple where sacrifices for sin made it possible for God to be at home among his people. And of course, even then, the most holy place of God's immediate presence was cut off from the people by that great curtain. But now, through the cross, Gentiles and Jews both have access to God's intimate presence. No animal sacrifices are necessary. No curtain keeps us away because Jesus offered himself as the full and final offering for sin on the cross. The offering to which all those earlier offerings had pointed, but which he has now fulfilled. And so God dwells by his spirit in the community of his people. And I think we need to take that seriously. When we go to church, we're not just going to watch a show and see if the preacher is any good today. That's a travesty of what church is about. Now, when we go to church, we go to enter the presence of God among his people. He's there. He's here. His holiness burning with sin-consuming intensity. His beauty sweetening our souls as we see who he is. His glory summoning us to leave our idols and worship only him. But his grace welcoming us as family to come near to worship with trembling joy. Worship is a holy privilege. Never take it for granted. So there's our first section, the creation of a united church. The second one we're going to touch on much more briefly because I've already been hinting at it several times over the last couple of nights. And it's the mission of a united church. You can see it in chapter 3 and verse 10 which makes it clear God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's Paul's summary of what, in the heart of God, the church is there for. But let me try and just put this into context for you. Sometimes uh, at the end of a busy day, Alison and I, this is a bit of a confession, Alison and I unwind um, at the end of the day sometimes with an episode of one of those series on Netflix called Suits. Have any of you watched Suits? Okay, this isn't going to work very well, is it? Never mind. And uh, if you had, you'd probably not want to have me speak back here again. But anyway, it's based on a New York law firm with this alpha male attorney called Harvey Specter who has a secretly unqualified but genius sidekick called Mike Ross. And with Mike Ross at his side, Harvey Specter wins every case all the time. Because he's always done all the research, he's figured out his opponent's tactics before they've even figured them out for themselves, he's brimming with confidence, Harvey Specter always wins because Harvey Specter is ahead of the game, ahead of the game. And you might be shocked to hear me say this, but that's what Paul says the mission of the church is to be. We are called to be ahead of the game. How come? Because to be honest, it doesn't always look like it, does it? In what sense is he saying this? Well, as you can see in the text probably of your Bible, these verses from 2 to 13 are a kind of digression 
In verses 1 to 9, Paul is, uh, is explaining how his ministry is orientated around this great mystery which has now been revealed in the gospel that we've just been exploring at the end of chapter 2. Verse 6, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. What we were just seeing at the end of chapter 2. And this has shaped his whole ministry, so that verse 8, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. This was the distinctive mission of the Apostle Paul, not to stay within the Jewish community, but to take the good news of Jesus out to the Gentile nations. Now, can you remember back to day one? And to God's great plan, not for the church, but for the whole of the world. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Let me remind you that God, from the middle of verse 8, in fact, with all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect where the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Got that? This is the great plan of God for a fragmented and broken world. He's going to heal all of it in its entirety, in Jesus Christ. That's how big the cross is. That's how big the gospel is. That's how big the purpose and plan of God is. The whole creation healed and united in Christ. So what about the church? Well, we've just been thinking about how the human family has been fragmented through these great divisions. Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, male and female, slave and free, and so on and so on. But what Paul is saying about the gospel is that the gospel heals that division. It ends the alienation. It brings unity within the human family. So that now this united church that is being built through the preaching of the gospel to the nations is called to demonstrate in its unity... The reality of God's plan to bring unity to everything when Jesus returns. Have you got that? This is the sense in which we are called to live ahead of the time, to be ahead of the game. Because one day in Christ, the whole of creation is going to be healed and united and all the alienations end it. And now, everybody in Bucky should be able to look into the churches and see, ah, I can see there is hope because there's a community of people where all of the social boundaries here in Bucky are overcome and broken and the people are united in Jesus. What a miracle. And if that can happen here in Bucky, it could happen to the whole of creation. That's the calling of the church. And friends, we've got a long way to go to fulfill it, haven't we? Because quite often our churches don't demonstrate that kind of unity. Quite often our churches don't even hint at that kind of diversity. But friends, this evening God is calling us to hear the challenge and to embrace the challenge and to be inspired by the vision. Think what it would be for your church to be in that sense ahead of the game, leading creation into its destiny of unity in Christ. Because in your church, this diverse family of old and young, of rich and poor, and different nationalities are one in Jesus. Back in Southampton, soon after we moved into the, uh, the house we're in, a friend, we asked a friend to plant a little hedge for us because we wanted a little bit of extra privacy in the garden. And he planted this lovely beech hedge for us, which was wonderful. What he didn't tell us was that he was also planting a load of little crocus bulbs and snowdrops. And uh, I'm not much of a gardener, but I've learned over the years that these are the first things to spring to life when it sort of turns from winter to early spring. And I always love that moment the first time I cycle up my drive on the way back from town one day and I notice the first little flower from the crocuses and the snowdrops and it kind of makes you think well actually what it makes me think is hmm, winter's coming to an end. It's going to be a summer. 
It's going to be warm again. There's going to be plums on the tree and flowers in the garden. The summer's coming. That's what it's meant to be like in the church of Jesus. We are meant to be the first fruits, the evidence that the winter is ending and the summer is coming, that the division is being healed and that unity is on the way, that the alienation and brokenness of the cosmos won't have the final word in the story of God's universe because Jesus has healed it at the cross and you see it in the church. That's the mission of the church. And that's why unity in diversity matters. And that's why the unity needs to be real and relational and deep. It's why we need to be super careful not to undermine that unity in our attitudes or our actions. It's why we need to be the kind of people who are the first to try and build a bridge of love and care to people not like us whether they're inside the church or outside the church, so as to help them find their place within the body of Christ. Let's just talk about one of those really, really sensitive ones for a moment, shall we? Music. Music? Thank you, Jane, for the way you're serving us here. This is nothing to do with what we're doing here at Keswick, but I know churches well enough to know that music is one of the most sensitive things. Now, if we're going to take the mission of the church seriously, what's our attitude going to be? Well, our attitude surely is going to be to say, the music that I like is frankly right, and it's God's music, and the music that other people like is wrong, and it's the devil's music. Is that right? Mm -mm. But do we do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah? But actually, if we get the mission of the church taken to our hearts, we will be the first people to say, do you know, you don't like the music I like at all. I would love it if church could be a place where you felt at home because it's so important to me that people nothing like me can feel at home in the church of Jesus. So what can we do to help you find a home here? And then if the Holy Spirit starts to work in on them, and there's going to come that moment where they're saying, do you know, I have a feeling that you prefer some different music to most. Sing me one of your favorite hymns, will you? Oh, it's not quite my thing, but I really understand why you love that so much. Should we sing that one together? Can you see what a beautiful thing it would be if the church was like that? And what a tragic thing it is when the church gets messed up and split by something as trivial as musical style. The cross changes everything. It brings us together as God's people. It brings us near to God's presence. And it brings us into God's mission to bring unity and healing to the whole of creation. Please ask yourself the question, just in this moment of deep honesty and privacy, am I a unity bringer or am I a divider. And in the light of this passage, which does the Lord want you to be? The mission of the church. And then our final section, the building of a united church. This takes us all the way from 314 to 416. It's the theme of this whole section. And, of course, the goal of building a united church can only be achieved in prayer, which is why this begins with a prayer, verses 14 to 21. But I'm not going to stop there, not because I don't love that prayer, but because that was what I preached on at Bucky Baptist on Sunday, and so I'm not going to do the same again here. I'm sure you can get the CD if you want to find out. So we're going to focus instead on chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. And I'm just going to read those verses to you briefly now. Chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's receive the word of the Lord. I just want to ask three questions of this passage. Number one, why the church? Number two, how does the church work? Number three, what is its goal? Why the church? Verses 1 to 6. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, all of us tend, I think, or most of us tend to read that verse as Western individualists. And so we think that the you is personal and singular. What's my calling, we say? Well... The Greek word here is a plural you. It's not you personal. It's what the Americans call you all, or I think one or two Glaswegians call yous. Is that right? Yeah? That's what it is. It's yous, okay? It's plural. It's a calling not so much for the individual, but primarily for the church. And at heart, what is that calling? Well, the clue is in the word then or therefore. In other words, it's a calling rooted in everything we've seen in chapters 1 to 3. And therefore, primarily, it is a calling to unity, verse 3, works out in relationships of humility and gentleness and patience. Because remember the why of the church. It's to demonstrate in our relationships and in our unity that God is going to bring unity and healing to the whole of creation through Christ. That's our calling, to be a united church. But of course, to make sense of that, we have to first of all grasp that church isn't an event that you come to or a club that you support. No, church is community. Church is spirit-filled relationships. Church is diversity united in Christ. So the church can never fulfill its purpose in the world if we rest everything on one hour on a Sunday morning and don't invest in relationships. You just can't show to the world that you're not united with your brothers and sisters if the only only thing you ever do with them is sit in silence beside them and listen to somebody else talk. Nobody's going to believe you if that's your vision of unity in the church. It's part of it, but it's only part. Unity is about relationships of humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love. And Paul says we need to make every effort to build and preserve that unity. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, I'm not talking here about church politics, let me just say. I understand that there are times when the truth of the gospel is so clearly at stake that sometimes very hard and painful decisions need to be made. I understand that. 
I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about relationships between local fellowships of people that love the Lord and within those fellowships. And we need to make every effort to guard that unity. Every effort. That's a strong word, isn't it? That isn't saying, you know, truth is really important, sermons are really important, your doctrinal lists are really important. Oh, and if you think about it and you have a little bit of time and energy left over, you know, give a little nod to unity now and then. That's not making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, is it? Now, this is a core priority because this is the calling of the church. So, friend, when your chat with another church friend over coffee becomes a moan about somebody you don't like or about something in church that isn't quite to your taste, why not resolve this evening you're going to be the one that just calls a stop to it and says, no, unity matters, I'm not going there. Well, why? Just imagine if all of us this evening resolved that we were going to be those people that broke the chains of gossip and disunity because we were going to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Think how our local churches could be transformed by that commitment. And it's the clear command of Scripture. Or when a relationship is broken within your fellowship, Try to be the one that gets that honest, humble chat over coffee to sort things out. And don't go into that chat convinced that you're right and the other person's wrong. Because you might just be wrong, you know. We can only have those chats if we're willing to be convinced and to be changed. This is the why of the church. Because this unity... In diversity reflects the very nature of God himself, who is himself a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons united in the perfect unity of the one Godhead. And we, his people, are called to reflect that reality in the church. But how can it happen? How does the church grow? Second question, verses 7 to 13. And the answer is it grows not through what we do, but through what Jesus gives. In verse 7, Jesus gives grace, which verse 8 he explains as Jesus giving gifts. And verse 11, Jesus gives people to lead the church so that those gifts can be brought to fruition now we just need to understand how this works verse 7 to each one of us grace has been given as christ apportioned it and then verse 8 makes it clear this is to do with the gifts that he has given to build the church and did you notice he's given that to each of us okay so if you're a member of the church of jesus jesus has himself given you a gift at least one probably several, to use for the building up of that church. I wonder, do you know which yours are? If you don't, you're going to have difficulty exercising that gift, aren't you? So why not explore what those gifts are in the New Testament? Talk with some friends, ask for some feedback. What, what's my contribution? What can I do? And then learn to grow and move into that gift so as to use it fruitfully. Because verse 12 concludes that it's exactly when all of God's people are using their gifts that the church grows to become this world-changing community that we are called to be. So if church is just something that we consume or a show that we go to watch, rather than church being something that I am using my gifts to build, then we're rather miss missing out, aren't we? And, and the church is missing out too. And did you notice in verse 12, that word service or ministry, to equip God's people for works of service. It's the same word as ministry. Works of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. And I just want to say this evening that that word service of God or ministry isn't just a word for people like me that stand on platforms. It's a word for every believer. That's why I don't like it when people say, John, when did you go into the ministry? 
I've been responsible to minister with my gifts for as long as I've been a Christian. And friend, whatever your gift may be, it's important to see it as a ministry. So please don't say to me, oh, I just do the coffee. You don't just do the coffee. You have a ministry of hospitality in which God wants to work among people so that the way you speak to them, the way you serve them, conveys something of his love and his welcome. Please don't say to me, oh, I just do the kids' work. You don't just do anything. You have a ministry with the children to grow young disciples of the Lord Jesus. It can be through coffee. It can be through kids' work. It can be through serving the poor. It can be anything else. It's not just a job. It's a ministry through which Christ wants to build his church. And all of us are called to that ministry. God gives those gifts to everyone in the church, but he also gives people as leaders to the church. Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So I understand those five words there as being slightly different kind of emphases within the way that people exercise leadership within the church. Their leadership gifts and callings and offices of one kind or another. God believes in leaders. Christ gave leaders to the church. So let me just say, think long and hard before you dismiss or dishonor or defy your leaders. Because though we leaders are all very flawed and broken and often wrong and mistaken, God still intends the church to be led. And so it's important that we honor our leaders. But what is the role of the leaders? It's very clear there, isn't it? It's verse 12. It is to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I've been a pastor for the last 18 years of a church down in Southampton. What is my role there? Well, very often I can think my role is that I am to build up the church. Wrong. My role is to equip all God's people to use their gifts so that together we build the church. That's what Paul says about how the church is to grow. So a word both to pastors and to people. Paul says that leaders are to be much more like coaches than star performers. And it's when the leaders act in that role that we reach the goal, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is the goal of the church? Verses 14 to 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We've covered a lot of ground this evening, haven't we? Let me just finish with a couple of questions to ask you. Do you remember COVID? Do you remember lockdown? Do you remember online church and the agony of not being able to meet together? And isn't it wonderful that we're kind of back together and able to hear God's word together and celebrate praises? Wonderful. But one of the things I've heard and often echoed in my own heart so many times during that journey is, oh, I just can't wait for things to get back to normal. Do you remember that? Get back to normal. And of course, to an extent, it's right. But I think if we're going to take Paul seriously in what he says to us in these passages this evening, God longs for so much more than getting back to normal for his church. Oh, we might long for normal because it's kind of comforting and familiar. But what we've read this evening isn't normal, is it? It's world-changing. It's staggering. It's an inspirational and deeply challenging vision of the church. 
A church which demonstrates in its diversity and in its unity the work of Christ, which will ultimately bring unity and transformation to the whole of creation. What an inspirational vision for what it means to be the church of Christ. So here is my question at the end of this sticky, long Tuesday evening. Will we give up on getting back to normal and lift our eyes to see Jesus' vision for his church? And will we pay the cost and embrace the sacrifice and take the journey that we might be part of the fulfillment of that vision? Not part of the problem, but part of the solution. So that on this glorious coastline up on here, up here in the north of Scotland, the churches of Jesus will be so alive with his spirit, such a model of unity in diversity, that there might be no person along this coast who doesn't have the full evidence in front of them that Jesus is on the move to heal the brokenness, to end the culture wars, to bring hope and bring unity bring restoration to the whole of creation and to save a people from every nation, tribe and tongue and every strata of human society and unite them at the cross and prepare them to live and reign with him in the new creation. Will we lift our eyes? Will we play our parts? Will we embrace God's vision for his church? Let's pray together. Sometimes, Lord Jesus, when we read passages like this and we feel just the, the weight and the significance of all that you attach to your heart for the church of Jesus, we can, we can feel the gap, we can feel the dissonance, we can, we can feel, Lord, that we just fall so far short. Please have mercy on us. But thank you, Lord, that you love to pour your spirit on your people. And Lord Jesus, that you love to give grace to your people, that the church might be built to become all that you call it to be. And so we ask you at the end of this evening, so to pour out your spirit on the churches of this region of Scotland and indeed across our united kingdom that the church might be built, that the church might demonstrate in its life the wonderful reality of your healing and reconciling grace, that there might be compelling evidence in these aisles that God is on the move in Jesus Christ to bring healing to all things. Please do it, Lord, for the sake of your glory, for the blessing of your people, for the fulfilling of the purposes of your heart. In Jesus' name.